Okay, so now I'm going to tell you about what you're just about to hear in, these next, in this next hour. So this is uh, Kirsten and Christopher Shockey. Uh, the Shockeys live on a 40-acre hillside homestead in the Applegate Valley of Southern Oregon, where they have a cultivated sorry where they have cultivated a handmade lifestyle for the last 15 years. Oh goodness, that's yeah. old. I'm like 19 now. <laughs> yeah, and thank you so much for coming all the way from the West Coast. That's pretty far. So it's awesome. Uh, they got their start in fermenting foods first in their home, and then with their farm stand food company, where they create over 40 varieties of cultured vegetables and krauts. Uh, when they realized their passion was for the process, they chose to focus on teaching the art of fermenting vegetables. So Kirsten and Christopher still experiment with new recipes, helping others set up in-house or farmstead fermentaries, and teach classes at their farm and host small farm workshops. So thanks so much for, for being here. We should give them a round of applause. And so today you guys are going to be talking about uh, a brief tour of how spices have migrated around the world, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in 45 so. minutes, so we're going to be talking fast. <laughs> <laughs> it's like 4,000 years to cover. <laughs> um, thank you guys for being here. I came to the 2015 Fermentation Festival. Um, so didn't get to come last year, but back, and not only with a new book, but... Um, Old husband. <laughs> I thought you were going to say a new husband. <laughs> Writing partner and husband. Um, so we're thrilled to be back in Boston. And yeah, like you heard, we're from Southern Oregon where I don't know the, the uh, rain is kind of taking over the news because that's a way bigger deal than our smoke. But well, it's really smoky. So we're, we're thrilled to be in this amazing weather, clear. <laughs> So we want to uh, just take you, like I said, on a quick journey around the world. How many people here love spicy, pungent food? Nice. <laughs> Good deal. So we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, what humans have been doing to get that, to get that punch into their meal. And how many here have fermented before? Awesome. And fermented spicy stuff. Okay, so by the time this ends, everybody will be like, yeah, I'm ready to ferment and ferment spicy stuff. <laughs> and uh, in that, we want to talk about spice, but also, of course, about fermentation and how to ferment. Is there anybody here that's never fermented anything before? All right, cool. Well, it can't kill you. It's a super safe process. Uh, we were in here this morning listening to the charcuterie guy where the quote was the pick from the grave, well, I already forgot the quote. But basically, you can do charcuterie wrong and get really sick. The wonderful thing about vegetable fermentation is if you do it wrong, you will know it's wrong, it will tell you it's wrong, it will stink, it will be slimy, things will be wrong, and your five senses will say, do not put me in your mouth. There's no hitting, lurking, odorless things like you know the famous tainted green beans or anything like that. So. I, I like to start there because not everybody wants to raise their hand, but people that haven't fermented before, there's a few of them now and then are a little afraid that, you know, they they can kill their loved ones, but can't do it. So now that we got that out of the way, we'll find another way. Christopher, <laughs> 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 I'll take you on a little tour. <laughs> so when we think about hot, we think about chilies, but uh, from a worldwide perspective, uh, chilies just came on the scene fairly late. But humankind has wanted something to spice up bland things. And this is the only time we'll point you this way. But this is out of our book. And it's a map of basically the origin of spice. What we did is we asked a question like, why do people eat hot things or spicy things? How long ago did they start doing it? And you know, how has this, this changed? How has this involved? Well, it turns out uh, first, First people we know that ate something spicy on purpose was about 6,000 years ago, so uh, Stone Age. If you're in the European area, you're eating meat and fish and that's it. And it gets pretty bland, pretty boring, pretty often. And so they found from 6,000 years ago, they found the bowls, they had um, a garlic mustard that they were purposely putting in that dish to try to 
pump up the flavor just a little bit um, for that environment. When you look down, come on in. When you look down in uh, South America, that's where the chilies are. So about 4,500 years ago, Peru, all the way up to the Bahamas, the National Geographic Institute went through all of their granaries and what they found is these seeds that they'd saved from these archeological sites had traces of chili in them too. So people were mixing chilies with their grains up to 4,500 years ago. Even closer, probably closer to the Stone Age, so more like 5,500 years ago. They were also making them bigger because the original chilies are teeny tiny and um, they were attractive to the birds because birds don't taste heat and they would spread the plants around. So that was the chilies sort of way to get itself out and about in the world. Well, humans started making them all different shapes and colors and sizes. So that was also going on. If you look in the Asian continent, what's happening there is the chilies aren't there yet. So this is the famous black pepper. Black pepper drove European societies, Asian societies. That was the thing. It was literally worth its weight in gold and even more than that. That's where uh, lots of white guys got in boats and went far off to bring that pepper back. That's what Columbus was supposed to do. But instead, what he did is he found the pepper plant. He found those uh, the tribes were eating these peppers. And he was fascinated because they were hot, never seen them before. So along with potatoes and tomatoes and corn, he brings the chili peppers back. Uh, the Portuguese aren't so happy with his return, but they realize these chili peppers are easy to cultivate. The, uh, and this is where we get into, is spice evil? So, so a lot of mankind has vilified spice from one time or another because if they felt that spice caused us to, to embrace evilness, to embrace um, non-pure, non-clergy-ish thinking. Um, so what happened is, uh, the clergy said, yeah, no, this is spicy stuff. I don't think we want everybody eating this. Before that, black pepper was just kind of a upper ends, right? And yet they realized, but we could, we could cultivate these and send them someplace else and make some money. So the Portuguese took them through Africa around that horn and then introduced it to India. And now they, they're trading India. And what they find in India is they're finding black pepper, they're finding ginger. Um, and we're going to end up in India because that's the dish that Kirsten's going to do today is a cucumber achar. Uh, turmeric uh, is in this area. So it's amazing. Then it goes inland, so to kind of stay local, one by land, two by sea. It goes both by sea and by land. All the trade routes take these chili peppers, and now we're already into Thailand. So if you think of a Thai dish, you think there's chilies in there, but just think about it. For a long time ago, there wasn't. So what we did in the book is we did BC before chilies and AC after chilies. <laughs> We found recipes that were from 1400s, 1500s. Um, we knew they were fermenting because we knew refrigerators weren't back then. And so we said, okay, how did they ferment these things? So long peppers, uh, Szechuan peppers. And we basically just reinvented in our lab that idea. Like, what would that look like? And then we brought that flavor forward to the meals that we eat today. So that's the idea of what's going on here. And so for the chilies, um, the after chilies, does anybody know um, why they're so addictive for those of us that are hooked on heat? It does, it does. And, and since, uh, and I'll, I'll localize this a little bit because uh, Oregon has, uh, we're about a year ahead of you in legalizing marijuana, so let me tell you what's about to happen to you. <laughs> a lot. A lot of growing. <laughs> a lot of friends from all the other states that are, are going to descend upon your lovely city of Boston. And then traffic is going to be really bad if you think it's not bad before. We've lived a year for people who are stone driving, and it's just, I don't know what's going to happen here. Marijuana, sex, yeah, chilies, and running all fall into the same bucket that they give you dopamine because your, your body is trying to. Hmm? Endorphins, sorry, endorphins. It's trying to help your body get through something. Think about that one for a little bit. So it's endorphins that are coming. What's happening is when you eat that chili, um, the very first thing is your body wants to cool itself off because the pain receptors have said something 
burning just got in our body. So that's why you sweat here. Some people sweat along the neck, right? That's the first sign of trying to cool you off. The second is saliva really gets filled up, right? That's your body saying, whatever that is, let's get it past the mouth, get it down. <laughs> it also stimulates your um, digestive tract. So chili stimulates your, why? Because we're saying to the gut, look out, whatever it's coming, move it through. You're trying to just pass this through. We're one long tube, remember. And we're just trying to move this through the tube as fast as we can. So giant stuff. And then the, the endorphins is to, to calm you down, basically. It's to calm you down and say, hey, it's going to be all right. <laughs> so I think it's a perfect choice instead of running <laughs> myself. <laughs> Every time I see people running in front of our hotel, I was like, you could just be eating some chilies. <laughs> You're just good to go. Not, the other ones is your call. But for running, I think clearly it is a better substitute for most of us, especially at 50 and knees. So um, I'm supposed to finish up in India. So India, what's going on? 4,500 years ago, um, the Indian subcontinent, they're, they've taken it way beyond um, I know in Boston here, we've got history, but you know, <laughs> they're doing things with medicine by then. The culinary arts of, are far superior to what's going on in Europe. So they've really embraced and they've embraced a number of these things, not yet chili. So what Kirsten's going to do today is uh, a mashup of what they did, but they, you'll then see chilies are included in this recipe, and that represents when the chilies, the Portuguese did get there and started trading with them and the chilies get introduced. Is that me? That's my cue. The girl, the girl <laughs> with the cucumbers are up next. So let's talk a little bit about lactic acid fermentation. Um, and then we'll get into what I'm gonna be doing here. Also, we brought some samples. I don't know if this is all of them. I hope not because that's it. That's it. There might be someone someone more. had a tray that went oh, in okay. back More are coming. Yeah. Oh, good. Because I feel like that number and that number do not go together. <laughs> so what we brought today is just, it's just a real smattering of trying to represent um, a little bit about what we're talking about. We brought, on the stick, you'll see some gochujang, which is a Korean fermented pepper paste. It's made with a gochugaru pepper. Um, this particular one here is the full salt version. In other words, the traditional amount of salt that's used. We actually have a recipe in our cookbook as well for gochujang that is a little bit lower on the salt because with all our tasters, some people just were crazy about the really traditional high salt method and some people, you know, it seemed like more people preferred sort of what we're used to now in our palates. Um, the other thing that's really fun over there is you'll see a sauerkraut and it is from a local producer, Hosta Hill. And what I love about that sauerkraut is kind of like the traders who, you know, got on ships and were moving around the spices, you know, a lot of their motivation was flavor and people throughout history have loved, you know, bringing in new flavors and making them their own. And it's, it's so fun to see with all these small fermentation companies and this revival of, of, you know, ferments and fermented vegetables of this mashup. So that is a gochu curry kraut. So it's the gochu jang pepper from Korea, a little curry from India in a kraut from East, Eastern Europe. So that, I think that's just fun. It's really tasty. Um, and then the other thing is the achar and it's a little piece of cucumber, and that's the one we'll be making today. So vegetable fermentation, right? For example, here, this is a pepper mash. It's sort of the peppers version of sauerkraut. It is squished or chopped up peppers, salt, and thyme. And that's all it is, and it is amazing because what happens is those microbes get in there, they start eating the starches and consuming that turning it into acid, and they're also pre-digesting it for you. So as they're pre-digesting the starches, they're making it healthier for you. The vitamin C is increasing. You're getting vitamin B12 on board, you're getting K2, and your body can uptake it more because there are digestive enzymes in there. 
So if you're eating a hot pepper mash with a meal, you're doubling up on those digestive enzymes, right? Because the uh, pepper itself has those qualities that peppers are high in vitamin C by itself. Fermented, they're actually higher. So it's this amazing way, and, and we're really excited. We've been doing a lot with sauerkrauts over the years, especially you know in our first book, it's very vegetable-based. And the second book is very condiment-based because we realize the same process that you can use to make sauerkraut, you can start making these condiments that will really enliven your foods. Do you want to talk a little bit about the fringe and kind of traditional eating? Sure. So um, we talked a little bit about those bland foods. For most cultures, you know, eating was pretty simple. You had some kind of starchy staple in the middle, and you ate that every day. And then for some cultures, they got some legumes to add to that. But you have this thing that was coined called the flavor fringe. And basically, how do we get through eating this, this bowl plate of starch every day? What are we going to do? Whether it's rice or porridge or cassava or something. And so that's where all these condiments have come through. It's been a way for us to get through that boring taste every day. Something to put on that to, to enliven the flavor, basically. And also make the more expensive ingredients, mm -hmm. you know, stretch those out. So a lot of the fermentation in China way, way back, they think might have evolved from around the idea that salt was super expensive, the cabbage less so. You could grow your own cabbage if you were a peasant. You really couldn't afford much in the way of salt. You salt your cabbage, you get two advantages. One is this cabbage now lasts longer through the winter, but also you're getting some salty food in your diet. So. That idea around the condiments and fermenting condiments to me right now is super, super exciting. So um, basic fermentation, like I said, you've got lactobacillus working for you, and that's exactly what we're doing here. Now, most of you know that submerging in brine conquers evil every time, right? You're gonna get your ferment, whatever vegetable it is, squish it down under the brine, keep it anaerobic. That's the trick to fermentation. That's really all you need to know. I mean, you can you can really leave now because that's all you need to know. <laughs> no, books, no, no books. No books. Nothing. No, no, nothing. Yeah. That was a, a secret. <laughs> so that's, that's the big thing to remember, right? Well, with these Indian ferments that they've been doing for a very long time, start up in the Himalaya regions. How many of you have read about like um, Gundrik, the dried kale ferment in the Himalayas, okay. You know it's not tasty, so it's okay. <laughs> Sandor writes about it a lot, and it's, it's uh, yeah, it's just a strange ferment. But that same tradition brought us achar, and how many of you been to Indian restaurants and had the little side dish of the really, their pickles? Well, um, a lot of those now are made with vinegar, but the original achars and some of them still way up in the mountains are a fermented um, thing. And so the, the achars that we brought today, you get to taste the one. Unfortunately, we love to bring samples, but it's really hard on airplanes. <laughs> so um, what we thought we'd do is when we go sign books, you don't have to buy a book, but if you'd really like to taste something that I'm going to talk about um, that's not on your sample plate, please feel free and we're happy to share. Um, so this first one, I will pass it around though, and just smell it. It's uh, it's wonderful. It it is one of the ferments Christopher talked about. Where this is this is a really pungent ferment before chili. Um, I think I've got some chilies in here because they put it in now. But it's it's a fermented ginger achar. It's ginger, Sichuan pepper, mustard seed olive oil doubling in as mustard oil and ginger and that's it but it, it gives you kind of a sense of that type of ferment um, so do you think um, should those get passed out while yeah, there a that. way to do that I can figure that out for you okay, okay. <laughs> so how these these achars are different which I think is pretty pretty exciting is so fermentation get it under the brine right keep it in a dark place is often what you read 
these achars, what they're doing is they're using the sun to do the same thing as the brine. So the lactobacillus, our little guys, they like, they're fine in a anaerobic environment, but they're also fine in an aerobic environment. Usually with fermentation, the whole point of keeping the environment anaerobic is because you don't want yeasts and molds to grow. So what they figured out in the Himalayas a long time ago is that if you put in certain ingredients, so this is high with mustard oil and mustard seed, which has antifungal, antimicrobial properties. But they also, what they do, which I think is really fascinating, is they partially dehydrate their vegetables. So we're gonna pretend that these cucumbers have been sitting out in the mountain sun for two or three days and that they're leathery and not fresh. Um, because that's how they did it. They would partially dehydrate the cucumbers, get some of that ex excess water out, and then mix in these ingredients. And that's what I'm gonna show you here. And you'll see when I have it all mixed up, there's air pockets. Well, they sat that in the sun because it was not anaerobic like most of what we do with fermentation. And as it sat in the sun, the UV rays would accomplish the same thing as that anaerobic brine does in regular ferments. So it's kind of a fun, a fun ferment that way in that it just, it messes with what we've been all doing here with fermentation. So while I am chopping cucumbers, I'm happy to answer any questions either about achar or general fermentation type questions. No, no questions yet? Can you, can you dehydrate just by putting it in the oven? Or? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and that's what I do when I make this at home. I just put it in, we have a dehydrator, and I put it in until the texture's right. The other thing that, that this tr ferment traditionally uses is, how many of here are gardeners? You know the cucumbers that you didn't see under the leaf, the ones that got too big that are yellow? They use those, and what they do, and I don't need to do it here because these ones, the seeds aren't developed, but what they do is they use those. And actually, if you were doing this with a cucumber that was really any bigger than these, you'd want to do the same thing. And it's nice for the texture, too, so you just go through and take that out, then dehydrate it a little bit. What if it's not sunny? Use a dehydrator. Oh, you mean in your window? For the ferment. For the ferment? You know, I've made this in Oregon in the winter, and I think enough UV even comes through the clouds. <laughs> can, you, can you list the name of the things on our plate again? Absolutely. So on the stick is gochujang, and it is a, a Korean ferment. It's got rice flour in it, it's got fermented soy in it, it's got barley in it, it's been fermenting for two and a half years. Two and a half years? Two and a half. It's because we, I was in the second book and you had to do all your recipes and we wanted them to at least be six months and the book was due in eight months. So we did nine different varieties hoping that one or two of them would be real winners and then they all were so we ended up with a couple gallons of goji chunk. <laughs> so, if you come to our intensives at the farm, you will definitely be eating some of that. <laughs> Everyone gets some that stops by the farm. Okay. So now these are in place. These do get salt. So, so for two pounds of cucumbers, it's about two tablespoons of salt. This is about a pound and a half, so I'm going to be putting in a little less. So most of the fermenting we do and things like the um, pepper powders, or this is another one that you're welcome to come check out later. It's fermented green chili that you can ferment. Again, just chop the vegetables with salt. And this one's got onion and garlic in it, and it makes a wonderful salsa base. So you know how 
well, you may not know, but tomatoes don't ferment very well, especially if they're super ripe. But chilies and all the other salsa ingredients ferment amazingly well. So another strategy to use fermentation to save the harvest this time of year is to do things like this, where you've got the onions and garlic and cumin and all the good flavors of the peppers in this ferment that will last in your fridge for a year or more. And then you can chop in fresh mangoes or fresh tomatoes or your canned tomatoes that you know have that flavor and then you have an instant salsa year round that that probiotic is getting in there waking up and starting to to eat off of how long is it for men for that salsa this one um this 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 time of year usually is about a two-week ferment yeah but the thing about peppers is they can age much better than the sauerkrauts can. So on some of these, you can really park it away, especially if you do the, the mash where you just put whole chilies with a brine. You can let that one go for a month or two away. We've got we've got some that are have fermented for a couple of years. What about mold? What about so mold? I've fermented chilies I'm yep. from Mexico, mm -hmm. and mold is a problem. I don't know if it's because it's too hot, where I sure. So uh, we should have a new sh t shirt for our mold happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so the, the trick is that's that's that whole brine. So the brine's really your protection because mold won't happen below the brine, but mold will sometimes happen above the brine. And it's a number of factors. So I can talk a little bit about the science what what Tirson's going through this. So what's happening is um, there's three uh, lactobacillus that come into any of these ferments. Um, and the first one, Lunastock, it works with a range of pHs and its job is to start knocking down that pH as fast as possible and creating as much CO2 as possible. Because if you think about your jar of kraut or anything, no matter what kind of lid you put on it, you've got some space right here, right? And that's the ambient temperature when you close the lid, trapped in there. As soon as it starts fermenting, those bubbles are all pure CO2. And they're coming straight up. Sometimes they take some here from it with them, with the heave, but they're coming straight up. So when you burp it or when you have your air trap on top, that's exchanging the lighter air, the ambient air, with that heavier air, the CO2. Yeah? <laughs> Which is really the secret. So, sorry, we doing that purpose. So when, the, and then, you're pretty much all CO2. So when mold happens, it's in there, it's gotten a hole while it was still ambient. Sometimes just a piece is coming up, something's floated to the top, mold loves to grab onto a piece of something. Peppers are a great example, they're sugary, mold loves them. As long as you've got the ferment, the brine in between, that's fine. We always say grab that mold and take it out if you see it. If it's calm yeast, leave it because you can't get all the calm yeast and the next day it's back. And what you do is you keep digging, saying, this time I've got you, and you keep using all your brine as you're going after the calm yeast, and finally you're out of brine, and it's got you, and you're from it. So we always say leave that, but mold, like, we usually pull that. What was the word you were saying? Calm, calm yeast. Oh, calm yeast. K-A-H-M. It's a white, kind of powdery, yeah. If you, firm, long, if you firm it long enough, you're gonna get calm yeast sooner or later. Especially loves chil uh, chilies and tomatoes. Carrots, anything that's got a lot of uh, sweetness to it. Yeah. It's got that white. Yeah. yeah. You've seen it. Yeah. I'm sure you have. <laughs> okay, so what I was doing is I was mixing mustard seed, uh, Sichuan pepper, what else did I put in there? Coriander and sesame seed. So this is, like I said, it's an unusual ferment. It's dry. Has anybody tasted the has anybody tasted the cucumber yet? Mm -hmm. What do you think? You like it? It's really interesting, isn't it? So these are great. Um, there's lots of different kinds of pressers, pounders out there. You don't need them, but if you do have a small mouth, it's really hard to get your hands in there to do that. And the important thing about pressing is, is you want to get the air out. Altars are a little bit different, but you always want to, again, get everything below that brine line. So, but dowel rods or anything that you've got that'll fit down in there. So this particular ferment, um, like I said, you would just put the lid on and 
put it in your window to ferment. But I want to show you guys just general type fermentation strategies because we have just a few minutes left. Okay. So this, by the way, uh, if you want to look at it afterwards or over at the bookstore, this is a lemon achar, also a really wonderful ferment. It's made just like this. Okay, so this is down in here. And let's pretend for those of you that have never made sauerkraut before that this is just a regular sauerkraut because I want to show you how to get that ready. So the whole point, remember Christopher said, it's creating a lot of CO2 in the early stages. So if this was any other ferment, or you can actually do it with this ferment, but you'll see that this gets topped with olive oil, so you don't really need to do this, just <clears throat> tightening the lid's fine. But with other ferments, a really nice method to help avoid as much of the yeast and mold situations is to get that top covered. And while I'm not a huge fan of plastic bags, this method really works nicely, especially when you're teaching yourself and you really don't want to see yeast and mold. What happens is the bag lays across the bottom of the ferment, makes it anaerobic, but these wrinkles in the bag, it gives it a little weight, helps push out that CO2 that's developing, and it escapes through the wrinkles. So it's a really inexpensive hack to the concept of an airlock, right? Nothing can really get in there very easily, but lots of CO2 can get out. So with this ferment, though, we're just going to top this with olive oil in the Himalayas. This would be mustard oil, but it's not readily available here. I've read some places that it's illegal, but I've also seen it online. Um, I would also wipe this down before I did this at home but so there that's that's ready to go that will start sort of working its way down in there the sun the C, uh, UV rays will start doing their their thing so this method also works really well with a regular ferment you fill it to about there it gives you a little space close that lid tight and what you'll do is as you feel this get taut You'll just give it a quick turn because that CO2, remember, is a little bit heavier than the oxygen. It's coming from the bottom too, so it's going to push your oxygen out of the way quickly and then you're going to close it right back up before anything can get in. So another really great method. And with this achar, you may have to do that a few times too, but as that ferment goes a little bit longer, you won't have to. So in summertime, this time of year, you're gonna see those cucumbers turn that dull green color. In about two to three weeks, this will be delicious and ready, and you will put it in your refrigerator. How do you know it's done? You'll smell that pickly smell. You will be able to taste it. It'll have that nice acidity. And if you really don't feel comfortable with your own senses, you can use pH strips, and anything below 4.6 is acidic enough that all the things that we don't want in there can't live. And I've seen a couple of questions. With that kind of ferment, do you actually recommend not using their lungs, or if you have them, go for it? Um, I would say if you have them, go for it. Yeah, I think it's fine. You're not going to get a lot of air on this one. Yeah. You're not going to get a lot of air. You topped it off with oil, you said it's going to sink down. Right. Yeah, it kind of makes bit. its way down in there. And you don't need to add oil. Nope. You know, keep topping it off to add nope. a layer at the top. Nope. Okay. So it, it just does its thing. It'll start to kind of mix in and, and do its thing. This particular one, because I didn't actually dry them out, is going to, and you saw that salt went in there, there's going to be a lot of brine in here. Yeah. So one of the volunteers brought the jar, and she's going to get to take it home, and she'll have kind of a unique project. <laughs> she's, up, she's up for it. Yes? You didn't add any salt? I did. Oh, yeah. I did at the so beginning, a couple of tablespoons. The same, as usual. same as usual. Yeah, that part is the same as usual. There's and it's about the same amount of salt. So, which uh, two to three percent is sort of the normal salt range. 
Uh, you can go as low as 0.8. Our recipes hover around 1.5. Commercial pickles are around 5% just to give you, by weight by ratio, just to give you a sense. And if you are trying to lower your salt, one, one way to kind of gauge that, if you have a mushy, let's say you've been doing something that's working really well and then one of them turns out kind of mushy, sometimes it's salt because the salt's hardening the pectins. And so at, as you're trying to lower that, that's one gauge to say maybe I'm at that level where now I'm going to get a different texture anywhere from here below. Is salt actually does it's a little counterintuitive, ma'am? A question is I had was could you if you wanted to make hot pepper oil, mm -hmm. can you just make it with pepper, a pinch of salt, and olive oil, and like drown the peppers in the olive oil and put the lid on and put it in the refrigerator and Will the oil stop picking up the peppery heat? I would actually, it's like an herbal infusion when you do it that way. I would actually put that in the sun for a while because that's going to help draw that pepper out. Because think of olive oil when you put it in the refrigerator and it kind of solidifies. That's going to kind of, everybody's just going to go, eh. But to get that pepper to kind of infuse out, you'll want to put it in the sun. That's what you do with like calendula oils and, and things like that. So that's how I would do that. But that makes me think of another hint. If you're going to do brined uh, fresh chilies, if they're really, like Christian was talking about, some have very thick walls, you want to take a um, toothpick, or you can do a couple things. You can either cut the stem off the top, but you don't have to. But what you want to do is make sure that that brine can get into that middle cavity, that air cavity. So if you've got some beautiful thick walled chilies, and you think, I'm going to brine these babies up and then make a great sauce, if you're leaving them whole, just do a toothpick and poke some holes through there just so that, that uh, Brian can get a chance to get in there right away so you don't have a chance to have an air pocket in there. I know, I know we're almost out of time and this is a lot of information. Yeah, but Yeah, we can go to like 150. So oh! We've sort yeah, of naturally got to the Q&A section. But, uh, so yeah. Oh, yeah. the Q&A doesn't have to be over at 9.45. No. <laughs> or 1.45. Oh, okay. yes. Sir. We're fine. I can talk slowly. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing that uh, is, uh, I've never done any of this before, uh -huh. and the only thing that kind of weeks me out is the fact of all this talk about bacteria and mold. And I know. I mean, this is, I mean, how do you get to a point where you get comfortable with that stuff? <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, we didn't grow up, any of us here, in a in a place where that's okay, right? Mm -hmm. It's It's yeah. been germ germ management, germophobia for a long time. And there is nothing in the way we grew up that says that you can stick something on your counter for three or four weeks and then stick your fork in and eat it because we've all been taught, don't leave that out, put it in the refrigerator. So you're not alone. You just... Um, we're just unlearning things. We're just, yeah. yeah. You get, really you get used to it. And you give yourself uh, methods that... I. What I didn't say because I thought I had to be a lot faster was what method works for you? Does the bag work for you? It's sort of an open format, but it's pretty successful. You often will not get yeast or mold. This particular method, um, also, if you're keeping that really tight and managing that, chances of you're getting the mold and yeast in here is also pretty small because by the time this is all filled with CO2. You're not needing to open it anymore. This method here, though, you do have to manage it at the beginning, right? And some people love that. They want to communicate with their ferment every day. It's like, oh, yeah, you're alive. I see your bubbles. If you've got kids or grandkids or anybody in the neighborhood, this is a great kid project. We teach all the way down to preschoolers how to make sauerkraut. And a lot of these kids have never gotten to really touch their food and not get in trouble. So the fact that they get to massage, you know, this cabbage with salt and, and taste it right away like a salty chip. And then we talk about this. So if you want to explain this to, to significant others or younger, we talk about those bacteria. All they get to do is sit around and eat sugar all day and fart. <laughs> when you want to see a six-year-old light up and he's like that's a job <laughs> so, but they suddenly bacteria is like the coolest animal they've ever heard of in their life it's like that's what i want to be when i grow up as a bacteria and so then we say you know when you, when you take this home this project home when you turn that lid 
it's millions of farts coming out. And you can see them, and they're carrying it home, like they're just building up, and they're already starting to do it. It's like, you're not gonna get any yet. You gotta leave them alone for a while. You know, it's like your brother and you in the den, just like, wait. And they're so excited. So that's the other thing is, get, if you've got little ones, to, to not have to unlearn what we're having to unlearn, is, is start them out young like this, you know, that this is okay, this is something, and, and it's exciting, and it's fun, and there's, there's all kinds of science involved in it, and you can eat it. That's the best way to, you know, in 30 years, not have what we have, which is, uh, I don't know if I could do this. <laughs> but using weights and airlocks, or like I said, some of these methods that are yeah. more closed than the traditional open crock, where you just have your weight and the brine's all exposed to the air, um, you're gonna get a lot less chance. And, and a lot of these ferments, you know, especially if you're making small ones and teaching yourself in a small batch, because a, a big crock is going to take um, anywhere from, you know, a, couple, a month to, a, to, to longer. But these little guys, I mean, they, they ferment so quickly. I mean, there's not a lot in here to, for the microbes to work through. There's, it's not dense. And so they ferment really quickly. And I've noticed, too, when I do a lot of smaller batches that are fermenting quickly, I'm also way less likely to just even get the mold because it's not exposed, it's not out there as long. So 